Carson Block with Zeros TV and thrilled to be interviewing Kyle Bass. Kyle and I have gotten to know each other the past couple of years, mostly talking about China, but I'm really impressed by Kyle's eclectic investing style, especially when it comes to short selling. And I'm thrilled to have you here, Kyle. So thank you for joining us. Well, Carson, it's an honor to be with you. You are uh, one of the greats, and as you know, there there aren't that there aren't that many in the in the short selling business. <laughs> it's kind of easy to be uh, well regarded since nobody does this. But yeah, thank you. Reading about your background, um, it's it's really interesting because you know there was that. That whole thing with um, you know, Michael Lewis's book about equities in Dallas and made it sound like, at least at Solomon, that was sort of a career death sentence. But you started out your career on the sell side in Dallas, and it seems like that gave you a lot of intellectual freedom to really be all over the capital structure and doing different strategies. Is that an accurate read as to how you, how you, the foundations of your career and you know, what led you to where you are today? Yeah, it is, Carson. And, uh, you know, in doing, in engaging in the financial markets and the manner in which, uh, let's say, you and I look at things, uh, back then, uh, if you remember Bear Stearns, where I, where I was uh, a senior managing director and, and covering and working with a venture-driven special sit funds, um, Bear Stearns had one of the world's best risk-arb groups. We had a great uh, spin-off and restructuring group and um, those were those were you would think in ways that were different than uh, just looking at relative PEs and growth versus value and all the things that, let's say, traditional portfolio managers do. You kind of get into a little bit more of the Wild West, you know, in bankruptcy and in uh, spinoffs. And then invariably you end up uh, getting involved in understanding how frauds operate and how people take advantage of others in, in the markets. You know, what were some of the earlier situations that you looked at? <laughs> uh, so my very first one uh, was in 19, boy, let me tell you when this was, 1992, 93. Um, if you remember, uh, we, had the, we had the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall in 89, uh, and we had uh, the reunification of West Germany and East Germany. And there were some uh, publicly listed securities in a uh, shipping company that was an old East German shipbuilder. It was called Bremer Volcan. And I was working with II's number one shipping analyst. And um, we went to go uh, have a look at this company and uh, really dig into the financials. And we figured out that the executives were buying cars and houses and boats uh, with the money. And it was never really going to build these ships in East Germany. And... Um, um, it was the worst possible thing that could have happened, Carson. This was back when there actually still were DMARCs. So many of the people watching this video won't remember when that happened. Uh, but it went from 100 DMARCs to 80 to 60 to 40. And um, uh, I was in Australia and I opened up the Financial Times in Australia in 1994, my first trip to Australia. And uh, it, was, it was literally the German authorities closing the gates of Bremer Volcan and locking them up. And, and realizing that they, was, they were filing bankruptcy and it was a fraud. It never went up, it never had a short squeeze, and it went straight to zero. Again, as you and I both know, that's akin to kind of going to Las Vegas and winning big the first time and thinking it's easy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what, one of the points that I'm fond of making um, is that if you're, if you're shorting frauds, it's really tough to do that if you don't have a way of getting the information out there. Back in the 90s, and I'd say even before the financial crisis, there was much more of a financial investigative media out there that short sellers could get these stories to. But I mean, since then, with all the newsroom cuts and really the shortening of the human attention span into you know, an appetite just for sound bites, it's pretty tough to do that. China has a closed capital account, and so they purport to be 15% of global GDP, 
and yet one and a half percent of their currency transactions settle in their own currency. Uh, and so it's important to note that China has an insatiable and desperate need for the way you think about it is anything that can really be spent, dollars, euros, yen, or pounds. No one trusts the RMB, no one trusts the Chinese government. And so you must have some sort of Western currency if you're going to deal, if you're going to enter into contractual relationships with uh, the, the Chinese government. And so most everything that they um, settle in is dollars. And so, again, our view is that is their Achilles heel. And that is where you're going to see the United States focus going forward. Having had that view, um, I think before this year, has has COVID altered or solidified your view, I should say? And the, the corollary to my question is that I do wonder whether when the dust has settled from COVID, whether that's six months from now, two years, whatever it is, whether we're not going to see a phenomenon around the world where people look around at the grassroots level and are just furious at China for what has happened and put pressure on their political leaders to, to actually decouple the economy. So not just in the U S so has, you know, so look, number one, I guess, do you think that there could be something to that? No offense taken. If you don't number two has COVID, how has COVID played into this thesis? There's only one person in the world that could ever unite the Republicans and Democrats in the United States, and that person is Xi Jinping. Uh, when, you, when you saw the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act or the Hong Kong Autonomy Act get passed through, through Congress and the Senate and, and fly across the president's desk, what, what legislation have you seen run through the United States with unanimity, with literal full approval from both sides? Those are the only two pieces of, of legislation I've seen go that way. So when you look at China, China's playing its hand and the manner in which they lied their way through uh, the Wuhan Chinese flu, uh, it, it, it is telling to the world, the world knows they lied all the way through. The world knows that Chinese, the Chinese government and the World Health Organization knew that this was a, a contagious uh, via airborne uh, 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 molecules by December. Seven doctors in the same hospital ended up with this in China in December. They knew it. They knew it right away. And when China banned travel from Wuhan, fr uh, from Wuhan to the rest of China, they continued to let flights, international flights, leave Wuhan uh, for weeks before we shut it down. We think 500,000 Chinese from Wuhan alone landed in the United States in that time frame. That's China knew what they were doing. The government did this intentionally. Once they fumbled the football in their own end zone, they blew it for the rest of the world. 